Hello and welcome to World Talks on TVP World with me, Ashim Kumar. A political revolution in Washington is in full swing. President-elect of the United States, Donald Trump, has announced new picks for his cabinet. Among them is the controversial billionaire and owner of the social media platform X, Elon Musk. Trump appointed South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem as head of the Department of Homeland Security. Fox News host and decorated Army veteran Peter Hexeth has been chosen as Secretary of Defense, while John Ratcliffe, a former director of national intelligence, will return as CIA director. Former Arkansas Governor uh, Mike Huckabee has been named the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, while New York real estate mogul Stephen Vitkoff will serve as Trump's envoy to the Middle East. He has also named Tulsi Gabbard, Director of National Intelligence, calling her a fearless spirit, and Matt Gates as Attorney General. Trump and Biden also met on Wednesday. Well, what did they discuss? Well, to give us his assessment, we're joined by Scott Lucas, Professor of American Studies at University College Dublin and a regular contributor. Professor, welcome back to TV World. Thank you for having me here. So, pleasure as always, sir. So now, before we get to Trump's cabinet, let's start with the meeting between Trump and Biden yesterday. What do you think happened? Had you been a fly on the wall there? Well, they played nice. Uh, they were there before the cameras. There was very little substance away from the cameras. While they were there, Joe Biden quite rightly said that, you know, the emphasis had to be on a peaceful transition, an orderly transition. I think implicit in those statements were the contrast with four years ago, where Donald Trump, of course, tried to block that transition to the point of attempting a coup. Uh, Trump played nice yesterday as well, though. Uh, he made a statement in which he said politics is tough. And then he said, well, it cannot be very nice, but now it's a nice day. You know, it, it was pleasantries. Right. Uh, what is far more disturbing is what's happening behind the scenes, which I think we'll discuss with all those cabinet picks. Well, well, we'll certainly come to that in just a second. But before that, um, I want to put to you a statement by the Ukrainian foreign minister who said that Biden intends to provide Ukraine with significant aid before the end of his term and a potential breakthrough in the use of long range weapons. What do you think this might mean? Well, I think the first thing, uh, because the Ukraine foreign minister met the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, in Brussels yesterday was that assurance that there's about $9 billion of authorized U.S. military aid uh, that hasn't yet been uh, dispersed and that this will be sent to Ukraine before January 20th when Trump takes office because of Trump's threat to cut off all American assistance. So that's the first thing. America continues, you know, for the next two months, Ukraine gets significant American military aid. But that question here is, is after months of blocking Ukraine's long-range strikes inside Russia, including with British and French missiles, will the U.S. finally lift the prohibition? Will it take the handcuffs off? Uh, there was another statement by Anthony Blinken you referred to a few minutes ago, which indicated that maybe North Korean troops inside Russia, alongside Russia forces, have changed the balance of this, and that the U.S. may allow the strikes uh, because of that change dynamic. Uh, but if they're going to do it, the U.S. needs to do it now. You know, you don't have the luxury of time of waiting until January because Donald Trump will be on the side of the Kremlin. And Washington knows that. Ukraine knows that. Uh, so you have to act. OK, well, we shall see for sure what how Trump behaves when he comes to, to office. But um, in a worst case scenario for Ukraine, perhaps, uh, he might pull out all, all support on most military aid. And, and um, the Times has reported that Ukraine could develop its own nuclear bomb within months if Donald Trump does that. Um, what do you make of that? Do you think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a realistic proposition? No, I, I think, you know, the, the Ukrainian officials, perhaps a little bit out of just the, the fear of what is to come, have always said, look, if you abandon us, you know, we could resort to nuclear weapons. But I, there's no serious plans to do that. Uh, Ukraine would isolate itself 
right. if it pursued nuclear weapons. Uh, I think the far more serious report is the one which is in the Washington Post, which is more than 10 European and U.S. officials putting out this idea that there's going to be a land for security settlement. In other words, they're looking for an end to the Russian invasion in which Russia would be allowed to occupy part of Ukraine for the foreseeable future in return for Ukraine getting security guarantees. Right. Well, we shall, we shall see uh, what happens there. In the little time we have left, uh, Professor, I want your mm. view on uh, President Trump-elect's cabinet. How do you think it's shaping up in general? And you can be specific. Is there someone in particular you'd like to talk about? Well, I think we start off with hardliners who are going to be Trump loyalists. And you could talk about the National Security Advisor, Mike Waltz, uh, the Secretary of State, Marco Rubio, who have in the past supported aid to Ukraine, but have now moved towards the Trump line in recent weeks. Uh, then you move to, you might call it the grifters, uh, people like Elon Musk. You know, he is not heading up a Department of Government Efficiency. It's not a department. It's an advisory council. And it's a PR stunt to promote Musk business interest. But then you get the craziness. And this has serious implications. I'll give you two examples. Pete Hegseth, who has no qualifications other than being a Fox TV host as defense secretary. Why he is there is because he is pledged to get rid of American commanders, generals and admirals. And that matches up with the Trump camp who want to dismiss those top commanders because they simply don't think they support Trump. And then secondly, and more seriously for Ukraine, is the new head of intelligence, Tulsi Gabbard, who has been a longtime supporter of lines on Ukraine. She echoes the Russians in saying that it's all NATO's fault. And beyond Ukraine, she is a supporter of the Syrian Assad regime, even as it killed hundreds of thousands of people. She is not a choice to support America's allies she is a choice who could wind up supporting foes of people in Ukraine and in Poland. I understand. OK, well, we'll come to Tulsa Gabbard in just a second. Just going back to Hegseth, I mean, he is more than a Fox News host. He was in the US military for 20 years. He's won two bronze stars. Um, and yes, he has certainly been outspoken uh, against, um, against the, the way the military, uh, the direction of the military. Uh, but then it's not unusual, is it, for somebody to be appointed who has no previous political experience, but does have experience uh, on the ground, if I can put it like that. It's very unusual to appoint someone whose only experience was serving as a soldier. Now, he served as a soldier. Let's put this out there. Uh, but he never served in a command role in the Pentagon. He's never had an administrative role. He's never had a policymaking role. He made his name by being on TV and by simply talking trash, to be honest with you, about woke generals and about woke admirals, whatever that means. And the only reason why he has been appointed, it's not because of his experiences as a soldier, because I've seen him on TV and thought, that's the guy I want because I want to bend the military to my will. Trump still blames the military for not supporting him when he tried to hold on to office after the 2020 election. He blames the military because some of those generals, of course, who were in his cabinet have now said, look, he, he's inept. He, in fact, was on the point of being a fascist. So this is Trump's war against the military, and Hexeth is the point man to carry it out. OK, well, we shall see as, uh, how, how things pan out over time. But in the last few seconds that we have left, Professor, uh, Andrzej Duda, a Polish president, has said that he will not give Ukraine uh, the MiG-29s until NATO guarantees its, uh, the security of, um, of Polish airspace. Um, what's going on here? I mean, is there some question over the guarantee of airspace? Uh, Poland doesn't want to be out front if NATO pulls back from supporting Ukraine. Uh, you know, the MiG-29s, in my opinion, should be provided to Ukraine. But it should be part of a comprehensive plan, which is you give Ukraine that necessary air power which it is needed for, for 33 months during the Russian invasion. And then at the same time, you talk about the alliances planned to make sure, for example, that Poland is not exposed. You know, if Poland gives away its leading warplanes and doesn't have warplanes provided to cover that, if it doesn't have a unified plan, it's out on its own. So I can understand the Polish position, but I just would urge Poland and all NATO allies, work this out 
work this out because the survival of Ukraine is what is at stake here. Indeed, indeed. I think there's uh, not many people who disagree with you. Professor Lucas, thank you very much indeed for sharing your analysis with our audience. It's, uh, I wish we could continue for longer, but not today. So we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much and thanks to your viewers. Thank you. And that's all from this episode of World Talks. Goodbye.